So last week I talked about, last two weeks, I talked about uh, things uh, that were going on around the world. And the feedback I got was uh, that I was being really optimistic. <laughs> and I was not really trying to be really optimistic. I was trying to capture the pockets of opportunity that exist out there today. And then in general, why some of the things are doing better. Um, but uh, if anything, it would be cautious optimism and uh, like to get into that. But Mark, for those who missed it, this was the best conference I think uh, we've had in terms of content and people and the whole setup. So great job. And behind the scenes always, uh, Anessa. aside from Jim and Dan is Anessa. Yeah. And uh, awesome, you were missed Anessa, but uh, uh, you were not, uh, not gone because we know all the work you were doing behind the scenes. So thank you. Yeah, that seems the invisible hand making it all work. Yeah. So I want to cover three things today. I want to uh, talk about why uh, we're off to a surprising start, uh, touch on what could go wrong. And then Brookings released a paper last week on uh, manufacturing in Ohio and the jobs. And I want to just touch on that for, for a bit and then we can go from there. So obviously, this has been a, a, a good year, good start to the year, good January, particularly from the markets perspective. And uh, economically, the IMF just uh, upgraded the uh, growth outlook by two tenths of a percent this year. Uh, and a lot of that is around China reopening. Um, but Europe is doing much better uh, than it had been in recent months and much better than I, I think people anticipated. And uh, that one uh, surprised me, quite frankly, but the warm weather is a big help there. I think China's reopening is a big help for the whole world. Um, and can they stay reopened? Uh, but uh, that and inflation is coming down as fast as it went up. I want to show you some charts on that because I think this is one of the things that's confounding people uh, right now, but it's also one of the cautionary issues that we have to look at because energy has been so positive with prices declining in the second half of last year and the warm weather combined to uh, really give a boost to Europe at a very critical time and, and a very vulnerable time for the system. So we're going to have an announcement from the Fed tomorrow. Uh, uh, Michael, I agree with your note. It's likely going to be 25 basis points and another 25, and maybe they stop in May. Um, but I think a lot has to happen. And But I think the big issue here is how close and how far away the Fed and the market are and how, the, how it takes them to get back in line. So I just want to show you a couple of statistics. And you can see this is a part of the roller coaster I was talking about. Um, just in four quarters, this type of change is really pretty... Uh, pretty unusual to see these types of swings. Um, but it's not just here. The improvement is coming in Europe as well. And this is the uh, German IFO uh, index. And you can see the business expectations are on the rise. The assessment of the business situation, though, is still declining. I think that speaks to the longer term outlook. Um, but the short term climate is uh, has been positive. It's been positive really since we were there in September, Mark. And I, I think we saw those signs, but I, I didn't catch it. Uh, the people were less concerned about the war than we were. They were less concerned about their economy than we were, particularly uh, Kristen Onoff, uh, uh, Odenberg. And I think he really, he really nailed it. But um, I think that's a big change. And I think the Europe and China and the US all doing well is a big part of the economy and they'll, they'll pull up the rest of it. But just talking about the roller coaster and why things are, inflation's coming down. This is the Baltic index. And look at the drop in uh, a couple in a five month period. Uh, you can look at lumber prices riding the roller coaster as well. You can see European natural gas prices as well. So this has been the positives that have been driving things as the supply chains have opened up, as Europe, as China opened up their economy, as Europe has benefited from the uh, weather uh, easing some of the pressures on energy uh, costs to them. That doesn't mean we still don't have real issues. So what could go wrong? I think, uh, and this is a country specific and then a global issue as well, but um, policy mistakes, either a political misstep in the, uh, uh, between the, the standoff on the Ukraine or what's going on in the South China Sea or now uh, uh, growing tensions in the uh, Middle East, um, all over the place, you're seeing uh, a lot of terror activities and things like that that could really disrupt what's going on. I'd say the second is a fiscal policy mistake um, where uh, we are not managing our policies well in, in a lot of areas. I think uh, this is one of the issues that the UK is facing right now. Other places are doing it. The US has their own mess of uh, government 
And then we have the monetary policy issues. And uh, this is really one of the big areas that I think is a big fight going on right now between the Fed and, and the markets and the ECB and the markets, how this plays out. Do they have to bring rates down because the economy is slowing so much or will unemployment come up uh, to make them more comfortable if they can ease rates? So I think that's one of the big issues. The second one is uh, how does the war uh, uh, progress in Ukraine and we have had good support from the West so far, but you can start to see some weariness coming in. And at the same time, Russia is uh, getting more aggressive so that we have to see how that plays out because I think the calming of uh, uh, the concerns about how we were supporting the Ukraine, uh, which was very positive for a while, um, has eased some of, the, some of the concerns about it, but now it's starting to rear, rear its head again. I think the reopening in China needs to stick. If it doesn't, that could really bring the economy down quickly. Uh, and it will hurt all areas. I think the energy uh, price declines are starting to reverse and uh, that's one of the big issues and we've benefited from the warmer weather, but that's we're not out of the woods there. And I do think, and I've talked about this over the last year, I think there's a have and have nots world that we're living in, not just from a, a inequality on an income basis for individuals, but I think you're seeing an inequality on countries and an inequality on companies. And it really is around uh, their growth rates and their debt and how they can handle their energy issues around inflation um, and I and food as well. And I don't want to miss food because there is a mess of crisis with food around the world. So we're not out of the woods by any stretch. And we are in a very vulnerable spot as a global economy. That doesn't mean that the optimistic view from the IMF and things are not OK. We are going to be in an OK area with pockets of real mess. And you just have to think how you want to navigate through that. So I think globally, we'll muddle along this year. Um, I think there are pockets of opportunity you want to look at. When we had our call with Ed Yardeni last week, Ed's been talking about a series of rolling recessions. And I think you're seeing that not only in industries, but also in countries. And I think as we look at that, that is going to make the downside possibly less bad, but also mitigate the upside as well, because you have these contravailing forces. And as one economy does better, somebody else is doing worse because it is, uh, we're not really growing the economy at a high enough rate that everyone can benefit right now. So I wanna just switch gears if we can, because of all the changes that are going on, and I've talked about this last week, there's a lot of capital coming back to the United States and that's through foreign direct investment, but it's also through companies reshoring and onshoring and friendshoring. That's when capital flows to the United States in times of stress, that creates an, uh, strains on the rest of the global economy, but it also helps us. It brings jobs back home at a time we need it. But then there are other issues, which I'll get into in one sec, because uh, the Brookings Institute had a very interesting paper uh, last week on uh, the high tech jobs and what's going on in Ohio with the factories. And one of the interesting things that I think is really going to surprise people is the number of manu of semiconductor manufacturing jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree to get involved in it. And I think this is one of the areas where we can start to see vocational programs replace college education and cost at a much lower rate and put us on a better glide path to get a more uh, talented and skilled workforce. But starting with the fact that um, many of these jobs don't require a bachelor's degree um, is really an interesting area. Um, just for fabulous design workforces, it refers to uh, designs and markets that um, you're designing and marketing hardware, but you're outsourcing the manufacturing to somebody else. So that's a fabulous design workforce. So it's not um, not what we're thinking of the in uh, on the plant on the floor. What's interesting when you look at this is the different types of jobs that are out there, and there's a much longer list in the report. Um, my limited skills on cutting and pasting and your ability to read it would have been uh, difficult, but you can just get a sense of the, the jobs and uh, how many of them don't require a, a bachelor's degree to, to work in them. And this is a really a positive thing given, one, this, this inflation cost in, in our educational system right now and the job needs that we have and how fast we need to get people into these roles. This is, I think, a, a, one of the uh, hidden positives that's going on out there. And then when you compare this to other industries uh, that don't have formal education, it's, it's um, you know, you look at just the high school diploma equivalent, and this is an area that can attract a lot of jobs that you don't need the advanced degrees. And I think that's really an important thing to think about 
as we're trying to fix our labor system in the United States, I think what we can look at here is a, uh, is a change in mindset uh, to make this happen. So uh, I showed a, a version of this chart. This is the one Brookings used. I showed one from the uh, Restoring Institute that would say that the number of uh, employment in the semiconductor and manufacturing area doubled in the last year up to about 360,000 um, uh, jobs uh, were coming in. So we're seeing a big shift going on here with the onshoring. But what needs to be done to make this really happen effectively? We need leadership with a vision. I think certain states have that and Ohio is one. I think there's more to, more to be done. I think the realization that funding is only the first step and funding takes a while. The, the bills that I talked about were over 10 years to get into the system. So you have to temper the enthusiasm with the opportunity set uh, because it will be drawn out over a period of time. I think to meet the needs, governments really have to think about these vocational training programs and getting back to what we did after World War II and through most of really up into the 70s where we had uh, vocational education as part of high school pro curriculums. And I think that started to fall by the wayside as we started to see manufacturing leave the United States. It was obvious why you didn't keep those programs in schools when nobody wanted to study it. But it's an important area and it's something we really need to focus on. I think regions need to get their acts together, not just cities, but it, to do this right, you have to create hubs and the hubs need a reorganization of the resources and an organization of the resources to leverage the assets that are there because we don't have a ton of money to do this. And most states are in a very difficult financial spot. We know the government debt is in, at a record level. And then lastly, I think this is one of the big areas that has to change. We have to not vilify corporations. We have to bring them together with governments in all areas of the economy to make this work because you need the tech companies, you need the uh, banks, you need the manufacturing companies. You can't vilify our corporations because they're gonna be the ones that are gonna help drive this success. So we need to create stronger links there and it needs to be more than talk. It needs to be a mindset change. And I'm just thinking about the way they uh, talked about, they're upset that the 1% was not enough to stop Chevron from doing a buyback that would be two thirds of their company or a third of their company or 25% of their company. So now they wanna take the taxes they were gonna put on buybacks from 1% to 25% for fossil fuel companies who they've told they can't really produce many, much more. They don't wanna permit, they don't wanna really support their businesses, but they want them to keep spending as we go through this. That mindset doesn't work. We have to bring these companies together and do this better in a, in a partnership with corporations, not push them away. And I think about China when I think about this and how they have a laid out plan for multiple decades that would say, this is where we're gonna, the industries we're gonna support, the public sector is on their own in these other areas, but for things that are vital for our economy, we're gonna get behind. And these are called strategically vital industries in their five-year plans. It's there as a level of specificity and detail that they put to what areas are gonna support. And if we don't adopt that mindset, we will lose big in the, in the fight that's going on. And there is a global war going on right now. It's not just the war in Ukraine, that's a ground war, but there is an economic war where the, the uh, China and Russia in particular, but other actors want the US to lose. And they want us to lose big and they want it to, us to lose permanently. So if we don't get our act together, if the West doesn't get their act together, and they're going to be a very tough fight um, uh, for survival. And lastly, the right um, outcome will definitely require a completely different mindset for all of us involved. So Mark, I just want to leave you with one last thought. There is a tug of war going on between the bears and the bulls. Or is it going to be a hard recession, soft recession? One of the things to look at is how housing and employment haven't really bottomed yet. Mm -hmm. And that could lead to earnings continuing to decline. And I do think inside the S&P, this is not a market to own the, this is not a time to own the market. This is a time to own businesses that are going to succeed because there are a number of companies in the S&P that are going to have a very dark year this year. I think the other area that we have a tug of war is between the Fed and the markets on uh, how, how fast the Fed will bring down rates. I think their market's going to have to meet to the Fed unless the economy really starts to tank, which I don't anticipate. A lot of that will depend on the China reopening and do they can they keep the reopening going? Because that has been a big boost to the global economy. Uh, I think they will, but if they don't, that could bring the uh, bull case, the bear case back into, uh, into view. 
I think there's a wide range of valuations still, and I think there's a number of companies that their valuations have not uh, reached the levels that make them investable yet. And I think there is an issue for, for the world. Is this time really different or not? And I think there are aspects that are very much the same, but I think there's some aspects that are very different. And I'll just give you one where you can say this is a very different environment. Coming into the financial crisis, we had a balance sheet of the Fed of about $870 billion. It's now at about eight and a half trillion dollars in 12 years, down from nine plus trillion dollars. It can't be the same. There are differences and you have to recognize them. So Mark, I'll stop there and we can have a discussion. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, lots, lots of moving dots on the map here. And, uh, and then wars behind uh, and different, different levels. Yes. Questions, comments? Well, I, I put a bunch in the chat, but Stephen, I mean, I, the, uh, for me, this looks like I just tried to summarize. I was just stream of consciousness, but as you presented, and as usual, I, I agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> Um, well, then, then uh, we're, we're both probably wrong then, Jeff. Well, there, there, there's, enough right, there's enough right in there. I, I, that I'm confident of. We just don't know what, how much of it was right. But to me, I sort of, again, substance over style, analog work over digital influence, um, balance sheet assets versus top line maximization. You know, again, I, the irony is that technology is, especially the SaaS model, is one of the easiest things to disrupt. Yep. Because those business models are largely to buy customers, to optimize their footprint, and then worry about profitability later, right? And we've seen that play out time and time and time again. I saw it, again, managing money. We saw it in other industries before SaaS became so hot. But balance sheet assets, if you listen to Buffett, he says, look, it, you got to start reading the balance sheet before you ever worry about the income statement to understand a business. And that's what, to me, is what I'm hearing is, and that's okay. my lens, is balance sheet substance matters over style. And building versus financialization. That real economy, Jeff. We're going back to a real economy where fundamentals matter and valuations matter, and you don't have the Fed put. And you don't have the Fed. <laughs> and, that's right. Well, that's really Ken Goldman, uh, who was with uh, Eric Schmidt's family, was was saying that yeah, the, the people are focused on not, you know, it was growth, growth, growth. Now it's profits. He thinks that once he, he thinks it'll shift back to growth, everybody will forget about this moment. But uh, that was a theme yesterday. Well, I'm not sure. Forget they will. They, it will get put back in whatever's fashionable, and the FOMO crowd will surface, right. and the headlines will validate whatever's hot at the time. But again, it's not an accident that the folks that are some of the smartest investors, not speculators, care about the balance sheet assets first and EBITDA margins and, 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 right? Uh, basic securities analysis. So that's just yeah. has been fashionable for a decade because the Fed put. Yeah. And, and Joe, I think that's gonna go into the private markets a lot more than it's been too. I, that's what I'm counting on, brother. <laughs> I, other, uh, that's other, the call I've made. Um, and sort of put other comments. On. Other comments? Michael. Joe, I have a question for you. Because yes, a lot of, a lot of the tech companies are actually asset light. So the mm -hmm. balance sheets are different than traditional companies. So yes. um, I'm not sure it's simply uh, traditional valuation versus growth valuation. Oh. Well, one part is the cash on hand and the burn that, that and extending and making sure your runway's long enough. I'd, I'd say it a little differently, Mark. I'd say earnings matter more earnings now. Matter. Yeah, real real earnings matter. Real earnings. Real earnings. And that's not a simple calculation. And sustainable well, earnings. And so, that's right. Sales margins and turns is the three KPIs that matter in that real value creation, not the financialization. You know, um, and we've seen this financialization Enrons and, oh, and, and, and I mean, there's a lot of this. <laughs> Although I got to say, it's but there's also a case to be real tech, which is uh, real investments and exactly. impact. That takes though patience. Uh, before real, that's right. Real balance sheet IP on tech. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a balance sheet asset. These others where it's asset light, because that's what got GE in trouble. That's why GE, anyway, I, I don't want to go down that path, but okay. getting assets on your balance sheet 
is a really dangerous and slippery slope because it actually balance sheet assets creates a competitive advantage. It's not easy to create balance sheet assets. Yeah. And that takes work and takes building versus just financializing and marketing spend to buy customers because you're the loudest voice in, in the room. Yeah. Joe, Michael, question for the two of you. Um, Michael, you had mentioned that the tech companies are asset or balance sheet light. Their assets are balance or their IP. Uh, isn't that a question of the quality of the IP? That is I, on think, their balance? I think in the, for, yeah, form, quality. I mean, again, is it brand or is, or is it, there, there's a variety of business models that Salesforce is going to be a great case study because Salesforce has been, their model was a bit like Bloomberg until that wasn't working for Bloomberg, where you make it so deep and rich and complicated, cost of switching is your competitive advantage. Cost of switching is a, that was a strategy, but that's a strategy that runs its course, particularly if it's technology is the basis for the cost of, the, the, the cumbersome nature of the cost of switching. So what is the balance sheet asset? Is it, is it brand? That's CPG stuff. Is it cost of switching technology, get embedded by customers and then make the cost of switching hard? That's, that's a dangerous business model. And it's very hard to do, have confidence in your forecasting of how long that pricing pet advantage will last. If it's tangible assets require actual building of something that requires and it's appropriate to have IP, again, that's a whole different format. So you think of intangible versus tangible assets and the IP associated with that. Thank you, Joe. Other comments? Just to say, no, we should definitely talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll explain exactly in back what you said. Uh, yeah. Hey, folks, forgive me if I seem excited about this environment, but, but the last 10, I walked away from old investment firm because of the financialization process. And now, as a old tool school securities analyst and, and portfolio manager, we're, I'm, I may get back in the business because this is the environment that's not hard to make money if you know what you're doing and know how to read a balance sheet properly. It's actually not and that you, and, much. And you don't act like an index. That's this right. is not a time to be an index. The have and have nots are gonna be felt in a major way. And Mark, I wish I had the statistic from the, uh, that was quoted on the panel the other day. And Bill Deutler, maybe you remember what Anna said about corporate credit and the risk that exists there today. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you have that? Do you know what um, number she threw out? Uh, I, I don't. I don't have the. I don't have the numbers. Uh, but she was. She was talking about a much higher level of risk uh, in 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 those credits than than I have heard about previously. Um, so which, which, certainly something something to watch. Which makes yep. sense, right? Because the average you know duration of those loans. Mm -hmm. five years and and there's been very little refinancings or new financings last year she was saying or a recent last six nine months yeah and so yeah that the pin's going to drop in, well, in credit. yeah I'm, I'm sorry similarly on the on the real estate side uh i'm always amazed at how optimistic the real estate guys are <laughs> uh, with, with apologies to any of, of you who, who might be in that space but a couple of more sober-minded guys who I have been speaking to have really kind of voiced the same types of concerns because there are a lot of projects, you know, that were that were bid out in um, or or penciled in earlier before a lot of this inflation, you know, started happening, and now many of them are 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 not going to make it. So you know, you can see, and also the other aspect, which I I was hopeful to talk about on the real estate panel yesterday. Uh, but we never got to it, was the fact that we've had 20% rent increases over the last two years, which is just absolutely not sustainable. So, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, as I mentioned to someone, you know, when you're talking about cap rates, you know, move, moving up and becoming more attractive, you know, my question is that, is it the numerator or is it the denominator that's going to change? Because I, I think that, I think the numerator on NOI is just pretty much tapped out. And and it's un, unfortunately it's probably going to be the denominator uh, mm -hmm. that's going to shrink. You know, but hey, we'll... Bill, I think the enthusiasm from real estate people is from the people who have no debt 
and are going to go in and take advantage of everyone else. And the people who are concerned about it are the ones who have the debt and worry about how they're going to pay for it. And I, and I think that issue is not just in real estate. I think we're going to see that issue more and more. It's going to create a lot of M&A activity where the people with strong balance sheets to pick up some really attractive assets. And this is where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Yeah. Um, think, and at the same time, there'll be new companies coming in and starting from these spin outs that will return to uh, real greatness because they're away from a big corporation and let them do what they need to do to be successful. So I think you'll see a bunch of that stuff going on, which creates a really interesting environment. And as Joe said, we're excited about where we can make money. We're not excited about the market. <laughs> okay. There's two very different things. Are, in, well, well said, in, Steve. Well in, said. In real estate, though, I think there's a case to be made for multifamily still. There's a, there's a pent up yes. demand there. Yeah, Mark, Mark, I can just chime in with an interesting stat for sure. multifamily specifically. Um, you know, there's there's a shortage of 4.3 million apartments that need to be met by 2035. So I think a lot of the excitement comes from the fact that there's just this unmet um, demand for 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 multifamily units. Um, and uh -huh. By the way, we you can finish your thought. I'll, I want to say something about Naples. Go ahead. Um, but 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 on this, uh, but, but I would also add like one thing that I'm sort of seeing in the real estate sector is a rise of special situation lenders. So folks that kind of come in and 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 help to bail out um, where where there's debt that can't be met or. Um, if there's some sort of, you know, mm -hmm. this bridge and, and, and they are, they're, they're kind of sharks. I mean, they're, they're able to charge between 15 to 18% and also get a portion of the GP stake just to get the deal done. So I think they're the distressed, I mean, to Stephen's point, like the, the distressed assets are, are very distressed. Well, one thing on Naples, and then let's talk about secondaries. So many secondaries funds are basically doing on into that play right now, and they're trying to institutionalize. Whereas, and a lot of families are have been keeping their powder dry to grab such things on the trip. Uh, has a diff, an interesting demographic issue that the governor, lieutenant governor from Iowa, likes to point out is that the people who are going to you know, the service economy, it's people in the service side of of the employment have to have to commute over an hour, if not more, to come to, come to Naples because it's just not affordable. There's no multifamily housing nearby. Um, just an interesting dynamic down here. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and Mark, if I could just dovetail into your comment and Amy's comment, I, I think it's important to segment the multifamily as well. Mm -hmm. Workforce, you know, there's there's a manager that that you know, at my last family office that we invested in, they're specialists in workforce housing, and that pipeline is as long as as the day is long. Um, there's no no end in sight for demand there. But if you go up the spectrum into into luxury, uh, it's a much different it's a much different story up there. And in Austin here, just to sort of it's the canary in the coal mine of of that, what you just said, Bill, it's, it's exactly that. There, there were some comments recently that we're seeing the higher end stuff getting soft, uh, even in Austin and obviously the, and the housing prices of the inventory has expanded the, you know, the time it takes to sell something. So the, if Austin is a canary in the coal mine on these hot real estate markets, there's tangible evidence that to validate exactly what you just said. Mark, what you just referenced um, is replicated often down in the Southeast where a lot of people migrated to during COVID and after selling their homes up north for big multiples and coming down and driving the prices up in sleepy towns like Charleston and Savannah. And so what you referenced there with the employment situation in Naples, mm -hmm. same Charleston, where work had to go, the workers had to go far outside of the city limits to live. But it's happening a lot in the southeast. I remember uh, a number of people have been pushing us to do something in Charleston. Um, we'll Mark, back. we have a hand up. Kira Shai. Hey, uh, so um, I have to say, uh, basically uh, during the pandemic, um, a lot of pockets have been filled with uh, people trying to work with uh, at least two, three jobs while being at home. I, have, I know people such as like bankers 
that they had a couple of uh, multiple jobs um, working uh, almost like uh, between 12 to 20 hours a, a day or something, something like that. It was crazy numbers. And they were making uh, big banks. Um, that's I'm talking about with uh, my generation, millennials. And uh, they have been able to move out to outside of the city, somewhere like within the suburbs and uh, like scattered outside. outside. And uh, it has forced people to move out of the city go to the suburbs and now the suburbs are becoming the new city and that's mm-hmm. how, that's becoming a new uh, scenario at this point and uh, hopefully um this doesn't create a lot of traffic but it will change the dynamic how we're going to see view the cities and all that stuff in the future but having said that you know a lot, a lot of mixed wins you know my uh the train station to into the city at short hills uh is packed it's and the i mean it's not like your sardines like some some of the, of the trains and you'd have but uh it's getting there so maybe it's a new york thing mark i did see the what numbers for new york uh, at the, at short Hills. Is that doing come well? up to uh yeah, yeah i think the number for new york came up to 55 percent uh uh office occupancy from 10 a year ago so it is starting to creep up and it's starting to accelerate yep. as well. Ken, Ken, you're right. The the real indicator is the bar at Short Hills at the train station. Is it, is it full? <laughs> I would, you know what? I think it's comfortably full. It's not like the sardine uh, situation, but, and I think what people, you know, people, and I'm only talking about the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, right? The Monday, Fridays, I have to say, or then it's at much lower levels. So I think there's a different cadence, at least for New York. Same in London. So I was going to say, um, I think New York, certain cities are different, New York, London. Um, So I'll look at, I'll bring up Cleveland, Ohio. Companies are trying to get workers to come back to the office and there's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that in other cities as well. Um, So it's a mixed bag. It depends on the city. Was my yeah that that's a I don't think this that issue is a city issue. I think that's a uh, almost a generational issue. Um, That what we did over the last couple of years is actually there's a I just saw a statistic today that um, in the labor force participation. One of the slowest areas to come back was the uh, 16 to 24 year old segment. And I think some of that comes to the the uh, financing from the government that was given out over the last couple of years, which is shouldn't keep them out because it should have run out by now. But uh, there is a mindset shift that's going on that to get that workforce back is going to require something different. And I'm not sure what it is. Either they run out of money or, or and have to work or companies pay up or or make adjustments but that part of the workforce has not come back the way uh, people thought a friend of mine at a family dinner um his nephew was there like 25 26 his nephew was incensed that this new job he has taken expects him to come into the office two days a week can you believe that Mm -hmm. yeah what does the nephew do i i I, we didn't get into that detail but i don't know It's, it's here in chicago Sounds like you'd like to do not a lot. <laughs> just, just want to go in two days a week. <laughs> but I think that's a challenge. Though. I think the workforce issue is going to be the one that uh, plagues us and will be our Achilles heel. And that was a common topic in uh, Florida was the immigration policy uh, still needs to be fixed. And we had the same people in Washington trying to fix it. So figure that one out. Because we're not going to get there without a significant increase in immigrants coming in to fill not only the high-end jobs and the skilled jobs, but the uh, entry-level jobs. We need more people there too. Uh, there have there, I saw like a post on uh, social media. Uh, I think it was from uh, Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg, Bloomberg, one of those two, and uh, they mentioned that uh, the Gen Zs are actually when they're hiring, uh, where they're applying for jobs they're having like more demands from the employers and it's uh, kind of they're asking for 
we want benefits or we want certain social cause or we want those kind of things. And the game changer has uh, happened like this a little bit with the new generation and what they're looking for at this point. Mark, there's an interesting question uh, about housing costs. Looking at Germany following World War II, they made a conscious decision to distribute the towns and villages to push into rural areas to create. And that, that's going on everywhere, I think, in the States as well. Um, I think you're seeing the cities push out a little bit more lately. Um, but you also have this big move to middle America. And that was a part of the discussion we had, too, where companies are moving to uh, lower cost areas as well. So I think you're gonna see a combination of both, but I also think the cities are finding people to come back and finding companies coming back. Um, mm -hmm.